Right, let me take you up on that, because I don't think it would end that way, because I think the trouble with what's been going on since we last spoke, in terms of proportion, is... It, I saw a, a BBC report yesterday uh, that the UN were reporting that 19,000 children in Gaza have now been orphaned. Another 10,000 children are reported by the Hamas-run uh, Palestinian Health Authority have been killed. 50 to 60% of Gazan buildings have been severely damaged or completely destroyed. And I don't see any, any nearness to the end of this because by Israel's own numbers, they've only killed, if you believe their numbers, and I'm not quite sure how they know this, uh, under 10,000 Hamas terrorists. That means that, you know, two-thirds of the Hamas terrorists are still to be taken out. So this could go on for many months, maybe a year. And those numbers of civilians being killed will exponentially rise. And the devastation in Gaza will reach a point where there is no real Gaza left. And I don't understand here, Ben, what the end game is for Israel. I'm not even sure they've worked it out themselves other than to just obliterate everything in what many see as an overreaction to what happened by a superpower that hasn't thought through the consequences of taking out the whole of Gaza. It's certainly hard to deem an overreaction to the murder of 1,200 of your citizens and more than 100 hostages still being kept by a terror group in destroying buildings, for example. Right now, what Israel is attempting to do and what the long-term plan is going to be, and I said this in the interview, as you'll recall, days after October 7th, is that there would, in fact, be a long-term military occupation of Gaza. The question is going to be when Israel shifts its strategy from a high-intensity campaign to a, a lower-intensity occupation, which is predictably going to be the result of all of this, because, again, the governing power in Gaza is still Hamas. When Hamas is no longer the governing power, the question is going to be what replaces it. Unfortunately, there's been no power other than Israel that has been willing to actually take up that question simply because the Palestinian Authority is incapable of even running the West Bank. The Palestinian Authority is deeply unpopular even in the West Bank. The Palestinian Authority is itself rife with corruption and Jew hatred. There's literally law on the books in the Palestinian Authority, pay for slay, that actually pays people for the killing of Jews. So that is not a power that can be in charge of the Gaza Strip that will leave Israel with any sort of sense of security. The UAE has no interest in running the Gaza Strip. Egypt has no interest in running the Gaza Strip. Jordan has no interest in running the Gaza Strip. Saudi has no interest in running the Gaza Strip. The United States obviously has no interest in running the Gaza Strip. So the question becomes, who runs the Gaza Strip? And if you are Israel, that question is not a question for a distant day. That is a question for every day. And right now, the military is effectively in control of the Gaza Strip. And that is likely to remain until there is some form of regime in the Gaza Strip that can be put in place that will end with the extirpation of terrorism that cannot involve the UNRWA, which is a terror haven, that cannot involve the UN, because the UN, unfortunately, has been cover for Hamas for literally 20 years. And so the question here is a tough one, and it's not an answerable one in kind of right now. The, the, and that's sort of the problem. Just because there is no good answer to the question doesn't mean that the question isn't urgent or that there is an alternative option available to what Israel is doing. What, what I've been missing in all of this is what exactly is the alternative option that has been presented by anyone other than Israel continuing on its quest to extirpate Hamas so long as Hamas is holding its citizens, firing rockets into the center of Israel and threatening Israeli life. OK, but my response to that would be that I think it's morally incumbent on Israel, who I've already said many times and believe to this day, have not just a moral uh, right to defend themselves, but a duty to their citizens to do so. So let's just park that to one side. My position on that has not changed. It's just how they've gone about it. And, you know, only yesterday we saw Israel forces dressing up um, both as, you know, in, in Hamas-style clothes and Palestinian clothes to go into a hospital on the West Bank and take out three Hamas terrorists. Um, and there are many people, uh, you know, impartial observers, who say that what they did there uh, contravenes international law, that they're effectively committing war crimes uh, because it's a violation of international law to feign protected uh, status, in this case by dressing up as a doctor or patient, in order to invite the confidence of the adversary and then proceed to kill or injure them. And it's also against international law for combatants who've been incapacitated by wounds or sickness uh, and are protected from attack as persons or to combat. So if they're paralysed or incapacitated, an attack on that individual is prohibited by international law. So I look at that and it seems to be a, a, a prima facie case of Israel breaking the law. Uh, do you defend that? Yes, I defend that. Because if Hamas, or in this case, Islamic Jihad, is using a hospital as a terror base, which they have historically done, 
then the violation of international law is on them. I mean, by all international law, using a hospital as a terror base, which we have seen in the Gaza Strip, we're currently seeing in the West Bank as well. That's the war crime. I always find it very bizarre that international law is invoked when it comes to a response to a war crime, but not to the original war crime. If you use a hospital as a terror base, then the hospital is no longer only a hospital. It also becomes a site from which terror is emanating. And so when Israel engages in a targeted military operation, by the way, not killing any civilians in this particular operation, killing people who are clearly terrorists, that is the war crime as opposed to terrorists using the hospital as an organizing base? That seems to me peculiar. Well, it is by the letter of the law of international law. Yeah, it is. What they did was a war crime. You, you can't dress up effectively as uh, doctors and patients uh, and take out people who are being treated, which is what appears to have happened. Well, it's unclear whether they were being treated or whether they were simply using the hospital as cover. That's Israel's contention anyway. The, look, I, I think that the problem is when you talk about this, you talk with great uh, clarity and you have a certainty about how you think this all plays out. I think what you may underestimate, and correct me if you disagree with this, but I don't understand how the kind of devastation we're seeing now in Gaza, the kind of huge death toll on children and women in particular, who have nothing to do with this, obviously, how that is going to not just lead to a whole new radicalization of Palestinians that will replace Hamas. So yeah, Hamas may well get permanently dismantled. Uh, they're clearly being killed in large numbers and clearly the underground uh, tunnel operations are being dismantled and, and Netanyahu has made it clear he'll keep going until the end. So assume that Hamas are removed effectively. Um, why do you think, Ben, that doing this in the way that Israel's doing it is not just going to lead to a whole new breeding ground of radicalised Palestinians who've lost family members, kids, wives, and so on, and who will want to exact revenge. How does it make Israel safer? It makes Israel safer by not allowing the governing party in that region to actually be fomenting the violence, providing weaponry, providing education to small children that reinforces all of the Jew hatred and anti-Semitism that has been reinforced in these areas. That's sort of like asking in the aftermath of World War II, there had been so much unbelievable devastation in Germany, in Italy, throughout continental Europe. How is it the Western powers could expect that there wouldn't be an entire generation of people who would rise up in revenge for all of that? And the answer is that a rebuilding process is going to have to take place. This is currently why, from my understanding, Israel is negotiating with the United States, trying to bring in the UAE, trying to bring Saudi Arabia to essentially put in place some sort of Marshall Plan for the rebuilding of the Gaza Strip that's going to take outside money, that's going to take a long-term effort. This is not something that can happen overnight. I think one of the big problems in foreign policy is very often that people are looking for the immediate solution at the expense of the realistic solution. And the realistic solution in an area of the world where conflicts go thousands of years deep is not something that's going to happen next week. It's going to have to actually require heavy rebuilding, heavy monetary investment, but monetary investment not via groups that are linked to terror and sponsor terror and foment terror, but linked to groups that actually are going to promote quiescence, that are actually going to promote moderation, that are actually going to promote a future in this region of the world where both parties can coexist. When I uh, interviewed you, I later interviewed Andrew Tate several weeks later in Romania, and he said this. So Ben is a warmonger. Ben has been wrong on basically every single issue you can name. He was with you with the vaccine and, and every other war. Ben is always calling for other people's young men to go and die in some war. He seems to love it. I don't know if he has short man syndrome, but he's always behind his desk calling about how important it is that big, strong men like me go and die. I mean, apart from the puerile uh, name calling and stuff, his point there that you're a warmonger, your response? I mean, if the question is whether Israel has a right to defend itself, the answer is, of course. And if the idea is that somehow I'm asking Israeli soldiers to die, Israel is quite unified in its goal. So I'm not sure exactly who he's talking about. The sort of chicken hawk argument simply would not even apply under these circumstances. As far as war, I think that every single conflict the United States should get in, I'm an American citizen, I'm an American, every conflict the United States gets in ought to be, we ought to be asking, what is the actual American goal? What is the actual American interest, which is for one reason why I didn't support the war in Libya during the Obama administration. It's why I was very skeptical of American interventionism, whether covert or overt, during the Arab Spring. I thought that was going to end quite poorly. So, you know, again, I think that that's inaccurate, but it's Andrew Tate. So I, I, I'm not supremely surprised by that. I'm not sure, you know, exactly what his level of knowledge is on, on foreign policy issues other than sort of the braggadocio. And his thing that he's a big guy, tough guy, and you've got small man syndrome. 
Uh, I'm not sure what to make of that. I mean, I, I guess that, you know, if if your version of manhood is walking around shirtless smoking cigars in Romania, uh, then I guess you can you can have that. That's okay. I mean, sure. My version of masculinity is a little bit different. It's, you know, being married with four children and raising a family in a solid community, but I guess to each his own. Uh, do you think Andrew Tate is a good influence on young men in particular around the world? He seems to have a very big one. Is it a good one? Uh, I think that Andrew Tate says, as I've said on your show before, uh, I think that he his diagnosis of some problems is correct. Uh, I think that his his actual prognosis uh, and recommendations for solving those problems is is more frequently than not deeply incorrect. 